Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Media Education Lab. Today, we have our fourth webinar in the series Inequalities in Media Education, and our speakers are Professors Susan Weisinger and Ralph Beliveau. They're going to be discussing the new book, Digital Literacy, a Primer on Media Identity and the Evolution of Technology, and this is the second edition of the book. I'm going to be sharing a few links in the chat, which is going to give you more information about today's event, as well as the book link. And I'm going to quickly introduce our featured presenters for today. Um, Susan Weisinger is Professor of Journalism and Public Relations at Cal State Chico. Uh, she, uh, her research interests are about uh, the application of media, uh, the social impact of emerging technologies, corporate media ownership, race, diversity, and gender representations in media. Um, Ralph Beliveau is a professor in the Gaylaw College of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, he's also a fellow faculty in Film and Media Studies and Women's and Gender Studies there. Uh, his work includes Screening Me to Rape Culture in Hollywood 22, co-edited with Lisa Fennell, uh, Gramsci in Media Literacy, critically thinking about TV in the movies, co-written with Erica Engstrom, and a couple of other edited and co-edited volumes. Uh, he, they both have joined us today to talk about specifically connectivity and digital disruption uh, and the digital divide, both from US and global perspectives. Over to you, professors. All right, thank you very much. So part of the way we framed this is to um, talk about some of the foundations and how we got started with the, um, the book. And it really started, I have been teaching a class called Digital Literacy and Media Technology since 2009. It's an undergrad large lecture general education course. So I get students from all over the university and I, it ranges from 50 to 125 students. So it was a good chance to um, get, a, get a good reach um, at the university. So it's been offered there. And then um, Ralph and I had met at um, uh, conferences in the past and he had the um, exactly the, the mix I was looking for. So we got together and we did the first edition of Digital Literacy in 2016, which we now acknowledge as a kinder, gentler <laughs> world in terms of tech. I look at it and I kind of giggle because it was a pretty short book and there was so, it was pretty simple. And the new edition is um, longer and it really tackles um, the meat of, of the difficulties we're all experiencing with um, digital literacy. So I think we're both really proud of the book. And onward, Ralph. Yes, hi. So, um... The, the key premises, it, it probably will become pretty obvious pretty quickly that a lot of our contexts are definitely Euro-American. So one of the things we're looking forward to is getting other perspectives from other folks in terms of the context they bring to the conversation. Um, but as a starting point, we, you know, kind of in, in terms of looking at snapshots of uh, the American context, uh, the U.S. has achieved digital saturation. Um, there are 85% of adults have a smartphone. Um, in 2011, 35% of Americans had smartphones. 15% today are smartphone-only users. Uh, and if you're dealing with students, you know that, that the age demographics make an enormous amount of difference in terms of who you're talking to and who you're talking about. And we'll get into that a little bit. And there's also urban-rural divides and that sort of thing. 12% um, have non-smart cell phones. And I know from trying to get my mother up to date on things, oh man, the world of, of non-smart cell phones is a, is a different kind of beast. And 2% still have no cell phone. So, uh, so saturation doesn't mean 100%, of course. And then when you look globally, it varies from place to place, depending on, um, you know, how, uh, in, in some places, actually, cell phones have been a, a quicker pickup than some of the technologies we use because the, the places were more suited to actually cell phone communication in rural areas, for example. Um, so, um, um, yeah, okay. So what our second premise, and these are really the premises, um, if nothing else, that we emphasize when we teach. Um, and so one of the key premises when I teach is always that access to tech 
tech is unevenly distributed. This is true in the United States. It's absolutely true globally. And the students are always surprised, uh, even when in a state um, like California where I teach, um, there's a lot of people who don't have access because they live in rural areas. Um, particularly in the US, US cell service is dominated by three companies, which um, we talk a lot about ownership in the book because it makes such a difference. Um, so Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile, T-Mobile was merged with Sprint in 2020. We're down to basically three big companies managing all of our um, smartphone service in the United States. And I always show the students these three maps that show the coverage. And I always say to the students, what's missing? Who's missing? Because we're coming at this from a critical perspective. And you can see that there are big gaps in the middle of the United States with very little coverage. So um, that gets us to other premises we'll talk about in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, one of the things when we shift and think about this is we try to think about the specifics that sort of determine how people use technology, particularly this kind of digital technology. And it's definitely influenced by some demographic characteristics like age, um, income obviously plays a big role in it. Uh, location, um, as those maps clearly demonstrate, and then kind of levels of education and how much the social context that people live in um, becomes either dependent on uh, these kind of technologies or whatever. Uh, the other part of it is that there are also psychographic um, differences in terms of how people use technology, which do have to do with things like belief systems and values and goals. And again, when we start thinking about that in a global context, obviously the variations are worth talking about and worth noting. Um, so America is heavily influenced by the doctrine of technopoly. And um, that's one other, the other term that I use with my students to talk about this is technological utopianism, right? This idea that uh, technology is, is solving problems and that it's got a kind of, this is part of the way it gets mystified as it's seen as magic and omniscient and kind of fail-proof. Um, and all of those ways of thinking about it aren't ways that necessarily incline toward a better critical digital understanding uh, of what's going on. So it ends up creating situations where uh, digital illiteracy uh, happens all the time. And a lot of that, as we've all experienced as educators or participants in this with students, is the difference between the ease with which these things are able to be used, uh, contrasted with the difficulty of actually trying to understand, you know, how they work and how they work on us, as Marshall McLuhan might say. So, um, going on? So um, Americans are living in different realities is the fifth premise, um, and that goes along with all the others. And we identified um, four gaps that we talked to our students about, and one being the technology gap, just the idea that even if you want it, you may not have it available in your community. For example, fiber optic, which would be state of the art, um, internet, which actually was laid in the United States in 1996, doesn't exist in most places. Um, in fact, where, in, where I live in California, um, it just came into the community for the first time. So even if you want it, you can't have it, basically, that you may live in areas that don't have um, access to uh, Wi-Fi, I mean, to um, cell towers, that kind of thing. Your phone may just not work. There's a lot of areas like that. Um, we also identified the information gap, which is um, the idea of adoption. And the gap can be particularly wide if you think something is for entertainment, right? Like say a gaming console, you may not adopt because it's just something that doesn't necessarily interest you. So um, here is a quote from a Columbia Journalism Review analysis of 2018 ele elections that talks a little bit of the consequence of living in different realities. For those of us in America who are extremely online, it's easy to think of the internet as the source of our problems, misinformation, Twitter bots, Russian hacking and social media stress. The real source, however, is the huge gap in information services, access and adoption. And then we are other gaps, the participation gap, the um, digital lack of digital literacy, the um, lack of ever getting the ability to fully participate, getting a smartphone, getting an iPhone because you think it's the best phone, but not ever really understanding what it means to participate. Um, and then also the influence gap, and this is about division. We added this gap for this book. 
Um, we also describe this as algorithmic discord. This is the algorithms entering into the equation, uh, the companies putting forward influencer material first, and again, we have growing gaps. So here is a quote from Zainab Tufakchi from MIT, also from 2018. I love that it was 2018. My students were like, that was a really long time ago. They were already about this stuff. Um, the problem is that when we encounter opposing views in the age and context of social media, it's not like reading them in a newspaper while sitting alone. It's like hearing from them from the opposing team while sitting with our fellow fans in a football stadium. Belonging is stronger than facts. So we get to the point about teaching digital literacy. And one of the things that I start with early in the semester is I have my students do a digital media inventory. And that involves recording all media use for three days. And when I say all, it's not just digital media. It would be anything in print, which is increasingly rare. It would be anything analog, albums, whatever you are encountering during your day. Then on the fourth day, they are to give up something. Give up, and I always say give up something that hurts. Don't give up gaming if you don't game. Although I can't tell you how many times I actually wrote that this semester where it's like, but you didn't game. <laughs> um, so they then continue to record everything else for the final two days. Then I also make them total the financial cost. And one of the things that I point out is that when I was moving out into my you know, own apartment, I maybe had to cover garbage water, cable maybe, and now they have a house payment um, built into their digital technology use, or at least a car payment. Some of them are really high. Um, and then they have to reflect and analyze. They have to write a paper about it. And it every semester I think, oh, I don't want to do this again because the inevitable student response has grown over time. I've been doing this since 2009. I've also been tracking the data. The data is super cool. Um, but the response is always, oh my God, why are you making us do this? And I love it when um, some of the students in their reflection have said, you know, I was did not want to do this. I was horrified that you were making us record this. And then I realized it wasn't the assignment that was onerous. It was the amount of con digital consumption uh, that's on me. So why? My answer always is because we're part of big tech social experiment. Um, and that studies show that relentless digital engagement is bad for your mental and physical health, which um, hopefully they're starting to register on. So onward, Ralph. Yeah. So um, one of the things that's really important to me in terms of developing our pedagogies for digital literacy is trying to help our students make a critical turn, which again, it's a very, very difficult thing because of the amount of effort that goes into making the use of digital tools effortless. So it really, I always tell my students, this is going to feel like swimming upstream. It's not going to be easy. It's, it's, it's something that is the opposite of what it wants you to do. And it being like the big, scary, tentacled media object thing, whatever you'd want to call it. I always like to juxtapose it as kind of like a octopus-like in terms of like a metaphor for thinking about it. But the goal of trying to get students to make this critical turn is empowerment. And we've had many discussions about this, the idea that what we're trying to do is, you know, sort of actuate people's reflexive abilities to understand what's happening to them in digital environments. So it um, becomes a critical take on what you're putting into your brain and the effects tech is having on your body. I often tell my students that, you know, think about media as being the stuff that you eat and therefore it's the stuff that you're made out of. Um, and, you know, hopefully that makes it a little bit more um, tangible for them to think about. So, sorry, I, I think I moved it far too quickly, but um, so tech connects and divides us is one of um, the key things that I talk to the students about as we're going through the premises. And one of the things that I introduced pretty early on and it's introduced in the book is the internet paradox. And um, the students are also amazed to learn that in 1998, people were talking about technology. Uh, so there was a 1998 study from Carnegie Mellon and it basically said that when digital engagement goes up, communication goes down, and that would be communication with family members, a shrinking social circle, and increases in depression and loneliness. And I introduced this after they've already done the digital um, 
media inventory and they often are just agreeing. They're like, yes, I am on my phone with people and I don't interact with other people or I just stay in my room and watch my shows because I can stay in my room and watch my shows. <laughs> so I also tell them that tech tools can both be productive and addictive. And here is a quote from an interview with product strategist Cliff Quang that was in the ringer. And he said, and this kind of goes back to what Ralph was just saying, fast food grew unchecked for a long time too, but today people are at least more aware of its downsides. Step into McDonald's and you'll see calorie counts on the menu. That's not necessarily enough to stop people from eating Big Macs, but it does present the idea that moderation in all things is good. If you look at Apple and Google and you talk to people who work there, they're totally into this idea of calmer technologies that is less, that is plunging us into unthinking amounts of engagement but they have to have a reckoning. They have to say this is a problem at the base level. And this kind of goes to one of our key questions for this session is what's the government's role? And this again also came from 2018. So, you know, in 2018, people were really loudly sounding the alarms that we had a problem. And here we are five years later, almost six. And we fixed everything. So, no, that's not true. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the it's interesting how actually some of the issues were have gotten even more complicated. Um, and that's part of the nature of technology. It has good and bad qualities. And so this kind of works away from the that technopoly notion of uh, utopianism, uh, hopefully not going all the way to the technologically dystopian, uh, but at least being able to look at where the solution to some problems creates problems elsewhere. And again, for students, making them conscious of it. Some of them are conscious of some of the interpersonal stuff pretty quickly because of their experience uh, with, you know, with uh, phones, especially with seeing how it affects their social interactions and things like that. Um, and depending on the, you know, the age of the students you're dealing with, they may or may not have some sense of how these things evolve and change over time. Uh, I always try to defer to try to get them engaged with a conversation about you know, how were things different when you were younger? How did your parents treat technology? When did you first get a phone? When did you first get a device that they actually it was interesting this past semester, they were talking about devices that look like tablets, but they're not. And this was when they were, so this was probably 10 years ago or something like that. So they were toys that were designed to look like tablets. So they were kind of playing and pretending to access the technologies that they were eventually going to be going into. Um, we also have contemporary social media uh, context being a very different kind of thing. And I always find this to be a really challenging thing to talk about, which is the notions of manipulation and surveillance with students. Um, because of course they get this mixed bag of the benefits of having been surveilled. Um, and perhaps they're a little less apprehensive and, and concerned about it. Again, this is something we've had many conversations about here, about this kind of mix of uh, empowerment and defense that plays into um, how we go in terms of media literacy. And again, going back to something that Susan mentioned previously, you know, this is all part of big tech social experiment. And if you've been following discussions in the fairly recent past about um, what's happening with things like content moderation, um, this is getting incredibly complicated. Um, okay, okay, so uh, go ahead. All right, so um, we need to understand the relationship between what's public and considered the common good and what's private and driven by personal choice. And this gets to be, you know, and Susan and I were talking about this a couple of days ago, the notion of the public is a really interesting one because there's the public in the sense of, you know, the, the, the um, you know, sort of like the, the Habermasian notion of, you know, sort of the public, uh, the public sphere. Uh, but then there's also another notion that exists inside of, you know, of course, this monstrous octopus of capitalism, which is that the public means shared ownership. Uh, and sometimes that's a very um, difficult point to make sure that students understand the differences between public in the sense of shared social reality and public in the sense of the economic realities of, of company ownership. Um, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. So public and private is a really, to me, a really important dichotomy that it's important for students to get their heads around. Um, and then also underscoring the global nature of technology, the companies that, and we'll be talking a little bit more about the companies in particular in a little bit, but they're kind of bigger than being from any one place. 
Um, we had originally had a, a section where we were going to talk about the satellite systems a little bit and decided to drop it out. But it's something certainly worth thinking about. The number of satellites that are going to be uh, around us is, I, I think, among the three companies that are putting these up, Susan, I think you might know the numbers a little better, but it's going to be in the tens of thousands of satellites that are going to be up. Yeah, um, mission globally for 42,000. Right now, there are a total of 4,000 functional satellites. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, thinking about upsides and downsides of, of, of the technology like that, it's, it's, it's going to help, you know, in terms of access and things like that. But there's even some unanticipated negative consequences about things like reflected light and, you know, the pollution of things failing and then going and getting burned up in the atmosphere and that sort of stuff that, uh, um, you know, it would be a very important thing to think about. My favorite is the Kessler syndrome that was, I think, from 1978, where Donald Kessler said, you know, we, we're going to have enough space junk that it's going to kill our space program because we'll end up with this um, potential for cascading crashes that will take things down. And Elon Musk quotes to go to Mars, and he's filling the lower orbit with satellites that often fail. Okay. Yeah. Onward. okay. Yes. Um, okay, so nature of Americans and how we think about these sorts of things, which is always uh, a very complicated thing. And the first thing is we like free. And of course, those of us who are in this media space know there's sort of the two definitions of free, right? Free is an unconstrained and then free is in beer. Uh, is I think how um, 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 the guy who wrote uh, zero the zero price point book free uh, talked about it, which is a really interesting way to think about it. Uh, what would you pay to have your di digital privacy protected? And the studies say that there is a privacy paradox. And again, with students because of their age difference, I think this is a particularly interesting thing to try to get them engaged in thinking and talking about. Um, and the studies say that when you're downloading an app or signing up for a service, you've already decided you want to participate. And you don't get to negotiate the terms, the user agreements, or what parts of your phone and app can access. It's kind of an all or nothing thing. Uh, the last data that I found was from 2017 that said that 91% of people don't read agreements. 97% uh, of people from 18 to 34. And if you dig a little bit further into it, there is interesting research that shows that most of the user agreements are written on a level that is actually equal to or exceeding academic writing. So they're hard to read too. They're designed, I, you know, this, this then shifts into that they're designed to essentially be uh, not read. Um, there was a just one thing that I thought was a humorous example of what's been. I think we all have these anecdotes in our heads of things that are buried inside the user agreements. In 2017, in Manchester, 22,000 people who signed for a free public Wi-Fi agreed to 1,000 hours of public service that included cleaning toilets and things like that, specifically. Um, and you know, and in Mailchimp's uh, Mailchimp's uh, service agreement. Uh, they say they actually have language that says that they're not liable in case of a zombie apocalypse. So there's lots of interesting, strange things in these agreements that, of course, a lot of us never see. I also saw an anecdote that there was a woman who won $10,000 because she read through the thing and it said, be the first to respond to this and we'll pay you some money. Um, I don't think that happens commonly, but um, but there there are other anecdotes, too, about uh, what happens with the those agreements. So one of the things that we added to this book is a chapter, um, an early chapter on ownership, because um, one of the things that stood out to me was an article I read by Farhad Manju. Uh, it was an interview with him in, um, I think it's 2017, where he identified the Frightful Five. And one of the concerns with the Frightful Five is we have these companies that were kind of scrappy upstarts that came on and were going to change the world and they now have been company, become companies that have global domination. And part of that is the number of other companies that they have acquired and continue to acquire. So Microsoft was founded in 1975. It's the oldest of the five. Um, it was computers, oper operating systems, office software. Apple came along in 1984 with home computers. And in 2007, the uh, iPhone. Uh, Amazon came on in 1994 with the goal of being a bookseller. Um, and Amazon has evolved. Um, Alphabet, which came on as Google in 1998, was a simple search engine that changed the game. And then Meta came along in 2004, um, Alphabet and Meta having changed their names, which we also address in the book. Um, 2004, Facebook, which um, definitely changed the world. So what makes them frightful? 
um, Farhad Manju pointed out that it was the control of vast amounts of data, uh, attention, and billions and billions of dollars. So in terms of data, um, when ChatGPT came online, ChatGPT has a very limited server that the um, chatbot can draw from. And Google introduced BARD in the last year and Google BARD uses all of the servers that Google owns. So um, the Frightful Five are gonna be dominating AI very, very quickly. And I'm sure many of you saw um, all the friction with uh, open AI and Microsoft kind of jumping in. Microsoft has a $15 billion investment in open AI. Microsoft's been on top of AI for a while. So this is, Ralph and I joked that um, the book came out just in time for AI not to be included. And uh, even if we were writing it now, I don't even know what that chapter would say because so much has changed in the past year when it comes to AI. So the other thing that makes them frightful is that they have full self-oversight. There is no governmental oversight, particularly in the United States, to any great extent. The fines these company companies get are laughable when they do get in trouble. It'll be million, oh, they got a million dollar fine. You know, they're billion and trillion dollar companies. So um, Franklin Farr, the author of World Without Mine in 2017 said, we've traded so much of our knowledge and information and privacy to these companies that they are now that they now effectively shape the choices we make and our worldview. Facebook would never put it this way, but algorithms are meant to erode free will to relieve humans of the burden of choosing to nudge them in the right direction. Um, again, 19, 2017, 2018, all of these people are saying, help, somebody look. So yeah, so this is again, you know, when you ask this question to students, it's interesting how they respond to it. What does ownership matter? And of course, again, this is something that, you know, keeping it, it's it's an interesting thing to sort in a way because you can kind of bring across the idea to students. If it's not something you have to know to use it, then it's probably something that most people don't know. So understanding, you know, corporate mergers and acquisitions and things like that, if it has a direct effect on them, then um, then they then there might be some awareness of it. It's certainly talked about um, in the news to a great degree, and certainly a lot of that information is available online. But you know, again, the number of people who are actually engaged with that, um, you know, they're more like the you know sort of like tech politic junkies. Um, so it's a really small minority of people. Um, so the market is divided into these niches of big tech companies, Alphabet, uh, in Google, Google, Google. That was I will use that from now. Google workspace. Uh, the Android. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, the Android operating system ads in the Play Store, Amazon, and um, their kind of um, pile of Whole Foods, Zappos, and their mail pharmacy and telehealth um, that they've gotten into. Apple with, of course, their phones, tablets, computers, headphones. App Store, and I think it would be you know, neglectful not to mention also the legacy style content that they've been producing, um, even though uh, there's interesting discussions about whether whether the Apple content platform is actually a little under the radar compared to others. And then what was the thing yesterday? There's the discussion of a potential merger between Warner Brothers and Paramount. So these spaces are going to get you know, again, this consult, this Bagdikian like consolidation that's continuing pace. Uh, and then Meta with uh, social media, the VR, the metaverse, and then their ads also being part of that um, big tech niche that we need to think about when we think about ownership, because when these things conglomerate, it has an effect, right? Um, so again, going back to Manju from 2017, um, he writes, you can decide to opt out, you can drive to Target, your life won't end if you don't patronize. Amazon, but if it's not Amazon for you, it'll be another of the five, or more likely, it already is, and it's too late to escape. This is like the um, the Instagram, right? The people who escaped Facebook to go to Instagram. And now yeah. they're escaping X to go to Threads. Yes, Threads, that scrappy upstart. It's just such a um, it's such a mess. And yeah. the reason we point out that the the big niches is because they are breaking it up so they're not competing with each other head on, but they're taking everything um, so that they're each taking huge pieces of the market. It's sort of like this tacit agreement. Well, we're not going to we're not going to compete with each other. <laughs> Let's just take it all. <laughs> so 
Uh, another piece why ownership matters that startups can't gain, tra gain traction. We don't have any crappy upstarts anymore. They get consumed. These companies buy them if they're doing something interesting. Um, so thinking of Truth Social, which is the uh, social media site started by um, Donald Trump and uh, a media company that's largely owned by Donald Trump. Uh, Truth Social was barred from the Google Play Store, which is huge. And I do a whole section in class talking about um, the January 6th uprising at the U.S. And I guess you could call it an insurrection. They um, One of the things that I talk about is the response of big tech, that most of the response came from big tech. We also talk about the uh, Ukraine conflict. And um, this semester, we even talked about um, the Israeli uh, Hamas war and how tech has played such a big role in lots of different ways. So um, part of the reason that Google Play blocked Truth Social was because they said the lack of content moderation violates policies on content, including physical threats and incitement to violence. So it's not the government stepping in and stopping the speech because it's dangerous speech. It's Google saying, hey, why not? They can post somewhere else. They also, by the way, just as a little footnote, we won't go into this in a lot of detail, but um, they, uh, these larger companies also put an enormous amount of money into lobbying so that when legislation is written, um, I noticed that uh, Barbara mentioned uh, and and Davina also that there's AI regulation that's sort of being contemplated and put together right now, and these big tech companies are, uh, as you know, again something that most people wouldn't know, but they're big players in how this legislation is being written, because of course they want it written, particularly even things like ownership, which is a really interesting, complicated issue. Um, so why does ownership matter? Because competition is reduced, um, because power is concentrated. Uh, as we all know. And again, this isn't new. This was a legacy media reality too. Um, so it really, it, it begs the question in a way, and I, I didn't want to go into a lot of detail about this, but it goes back to um, somebody who I've been reading quite a bit, Mark Fisher, who um, wrote about the notion of capitalist, um, capitalist realism, which was this idea that once you're inside of the system where competition is being reduced, where power is being concentrated, um, where companies they own can charge more and buy more and government oversight is non-existent, that basically it's impossible, Mark Fisher argued, to imagine a system that's different. So that's kind of the, the capital realist position is you're sort of stuck inside of this on a global level and to even imagine an alternative is, is next to impossible. There were also the big uh, hearings before our Congress where the uh, whistleblower testified that um, tracking young people was not a bug. It was not a mistake. It was a part of the plan. And everybody said, well, that's really bad. And that's been like, I don't know, 2021 at this point. And um, the government's not going to do anything because in the United States, these companies are too big to fail. The companies threaten to leave, among other things, and um, they're huge employers uh, among other things. Mm -hmm. So I think for the sake of trying to make sure we have some time to talk about all of these things, I know there's been a couple of questions and um, it looks like we're a small enough number that we can probably stay in one discussion here rather than doing breakout rooms. If that's, does that make sense, Davina? In terms of how, okay. Uh, but Susan Crawford is an important person to pull into this conversation. Hopefully you've all had a chance to see some of her speaking or read some of her work. Uh, and, you know, part of what she talks about that has to do with this digital divide notion is that sometimes when you're inside of a system where a certain amount of consolidation has happened and there's really when it when push comes to shove, there really isn't any force that's encouraging um, competition because of the way it's been divided, uh, then you don't even know that the services you're getting are, are are lower quality and more expensive. And that's what a lot of her work has been focused on. Um, it's always, as, as she writes, always in the news with daily stories about the wonders of augmented reality, the Internet of Things and driverless cars. No one seems to stop to ask whether those advanced uses of data will work reliably, where and for whom. And this reality is causing problems for our future, um, speaking in the U.S., as an innovative and just country as we fall further behind in the global race to create new jobs and new ways for citizens to make choices with their lives. We are amplifying and entrenching existing rural urban divides and even more starkly, inequality of opportunity. Which the pandemic laid bare globally, that the inequities, you could give students laptops, but if they didn't have internet or anyone to assist them, 
it didn't matter. And we do address that in the um, global digital divide section of the of the book. So um, kind of moving through this quickly so we can get to some discussion. When we think about governments globally, that governments generally have two general paths of influence when it comes to information communication technologies, one being infrastructure development, which is needed for participation in the global economy. You can't ignore it. Uh, but developing all of Beijing, you know, does not make China a fully wired country. It, it can lead to te a technology gap and access in inequities, just like in the United States. Um, second path of influence, information control, which can be political, societal, not wanting Western content. And I always ask the students, does this occur in the US? And they're like, oh yeah, I got put in Facebook jail. Uh, not the government, not the government. And um, as I point out, it's not necessary. We're not looking. We have a chapter on McLuhan, but um, Aldous Huxley, Marshall McLuhan, Neil Postman all talk about um, we're entertaining ourselves to death. We're amusing ourselves to death. We don't, the government doesn't need to ban anything because we're not looking because we're so entertained by our devices. So in the United States in particular, the U.S. government has ceded control of both infrastructure development and information control to the tech companies, which um, one of our questions for this was, um, how do we disrupt authoritarian tendencies? In other countries, the problem is authoritarianism, where countries are making a splinter net like China. In the United States, it's the tech companies that have the authoritarian tendencies um, and some politicians. So um, again, tr trying to race through this fairly quickly so we have some time to talk. Uh, the notion of digital propaganda is obviously a, a, a big concern, sort of like a parallel with digital, with privacy in the digital realm, that you know, it's it, you have to sort of take a step back from what you're consuming on a regular basis to start seeing it. Um, and Renee writes, Renee Hobbs writes brilliantly about propaganda to make it into a much more complex issue. Um, neither mis- or disinformation is new. Propaganda is used by governments to sway public opinion, and now it's being used more by individuals. You know, as we've all experienced, we get kind of overwhelmed um, by, you know, the amount of, of communication that we're not even really sure whether the source of the communication is domestic or from somewhere else, if it's, you know, possibly bot-generated or individual. Again, we've talked about that in this organization quite a bit. Um, this Tom Rosenstiel writes, misinformation is not like a plumbing problem you fix. It's a social condition like crime that you must constantly monitor and adjust to since as far back as the era of radio and before, as Winston Churchill said, a lie can go around the world before the truth gets its pants on. Um, and of course, the problem with mis and disinformation is how it affects trust people have. Uh, in 2016, Oxford Word of the Year was post-truth, that facts are less influential than who shares the information. And this bore out this past semester talking to students about this issue because we have this like crisis of expertise that's going on at the same time. People seek and share views and info that aligns with their pre existing views. 64% think fake news stories cause confusion and harm. 23% have shared fabricated political stories either by mistake or intentionally. And so that kind of all frames what we want to do in terms of discussion, the original questions that we posted, and we put this together. Um, and we can start with any one of these or however you want to try to approach it. There's a couple of questions that are in the chat that we can certainly get to also. But the questions we thought about what, what is the role of government in reducing inequality, how are freedoms connected to access and education being affected by authoritarian tendencies, and what can be done to encourage better and more equal experiences in the digital sphere? And I am going to stop the share now so we can begin discussion. Thank you so much. This was quite the presentation, and I think uh, it's going to encourage us all to buy your book and read it, because if you've managed to put so much in like a small presentation, I can't imagine how wonderful the book is. Um, I do have a few uh, comments and questions in chat. Would it be okay if we discuss them first and then we can go to your questions as well? Yes. So uh, the one that I have right now is Michael Hexman. Do you, would you like to come off mute and ask it yourself? Because you made some pretty interesting points here. Sure. Um, thanks very much for the presentation. I'm sorry that I missed the beginning of it. It's funny. You, you 
mark these down in your calendar but at this particular time of year i don't pay much attention to my calendar uh, even though there's so much work to be done um you said a lot and I, and I almost feel like there's no real room for a question period because it's a way it feels like you are almost answering questions the whole time right like so that you're going into one area and then another etc but um but the stuff about regulation sparked my interest and i and i put here a short question which you know what does regulation look like because i we always say well you know we're to the media literacy side of response but then but we really need regulation and so i start thinking okay well what does that look like and 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 so you know the Canadian government here um, sort of went eyeball to eyeball with Meta and Google and said, look, you know, you're going to pay up because you've taken too much of the advertising monies, and our Canadian news organizations are suffering terribly. So, so you know, you don't pay up or you don't get to play. So Meta censored the news, and the, that that's ongoing. And as I said here in this comment. I see more people blaming the government for that than blaming Meta. So they go, oh, the government, you know, it's policies, you know, good old Meta has decided it has to react in this particular way. So nobody seems to, you know, they don't seem to get egg on their face for this, but but Google somehow reacted differently. And, and you know, it's just a couple of weeks ago, said a hundred million a year and most of it to legacy print media. So, so you know, you always wonder, is investigative journalism to have a chance, you know, in this next century, and and that you know feels a little bit like a wee bit of support, but but so again, the question is, you know, is this example even what regulation maybe looks like, and what are your thoughts about it, and do you have another, uh, you know, example or two of what some productive, pretty easy government policy might look like that we can call regulation. I think uh, one of the things that Tim Berners-Lee called for in the 30th uh, anniversary of the World Wide Web was regulation um, and that the, the companies needed to come to the table. And I do think some of that's happening with AI, where the companies are coming to the table uh, and saying this poses a problem if we don't intervene now. Um, but I think without some sort of NATO, some sort of global response from countries gathering together, I mean, the EU is doing things. Australia did a similar thing to what Canada did. And I think Google pulled out of uh, Australia or Facebook did. I can't remember which one. Um, so people were mad. They were mad because they were pulled out. In the United States, there's been repeated calls to ban TikTok. Um, and in fact, 34 states at present uh, ban TikTok on devices owned by the state. 34. And there's a federal ban. And the students are just when I tell them that, they're like, how can they can't tell me I can't use TikTok? <laughs> but there, there's got to be a more cohesive uh, response from the nations to global domination. I think, yeah, I think one part of it also is that the, you know, that like what you're suggesting, uh, Michael, is the idea that the government in, in, in the framework of a lot of people's minds is them, not us, right? And so um, when I asked students this semester, should government be playing a role in terms of access? When you talk about children, they're a little, and, and I think practically this is what happens, there's a little bit more of a willingness to, you know, sort of developing regulations that where the social harm seems to be more tangible. But otherwise, more generally, I think there's just not even an understanding of this uncontested level of, of cultural power that exists. And people aren't willing to necessarily entertain the idea that there has to be some kind of governmental control over that. So it's it's a it's a complicated thing. I always think of these as really it's again media literacy public education issues and on a global scale. Because of course in other in other contexts there there's going to be a different negotiated relationship between, say, you know, religion and the state or the media and the state. Um, and understanding those requires again the same kind of um interest in how it's being done elsewhere and then seeing what works in other places. If I could follow up a little, um, it's roughly a hundred years ago that a little more than a hundred, but the radio wars in the U S when, um, you know, the, the question of policy, public policy going forward with this new, new technology was being discussed in government, et cetera, right. And the private sector won, and then that model then gets taken up by television and it sort of comes along. And then, I'm thinking as we're talking about the video game, unregulated video game world and the discussions about that in the 1990s, et cetera, where people are saying, why are you letting these companies create voluntary regulation, right? So so why is there not this, you know, uh, over, oversee, oversight? And um, 
The question is, it seems today that, yeah, I think one of you just said the distrust of the government is so high that, that you know, the notion of oversight is already troubled because oversight by whom, you know, we should almost have McDonald's overseeing Meta and, you know, like we're, we're more comfortable with these corporations, you know, anyway. The cigarette, you know, the big, the big tech moment being the big tobacco moment is kind of the, the funny thing here. And, it, you know, are we 20 years down the road? We're going to be like, oh, yeah, social media is bad. Like, you know, like we are with cigarettes. Oh, yeah, but we still smoke. <laughs> yeah, well, if you, if you combine that suspicion with government with the, the, the sort of like general level of, again, suspicion about expertise and, you know, the critique of science, uh, the way, again, that Postman describes the notion of technopoly is is that it basically, you know, for those of us who do tend to think that way, how do you get to discussions about morality? How do you get to discussions about kind of the more spiritual, cultural sides of things? Um, and that's, you know, again, if the suspicion of government is one thing, then the suspicion, because then you can think, okay, well, maybe we can create NGOs that are actually experts at this that can intervene, which is kind of what the media literacy movement's been doing, right? They've been creating, they've been having more of a kind of international um, expertise focus. But so, but then that creates, again, the new challenge to media literacy teaching, which is how do you develop in people an understanding of what and when to trust those kind of organizations? There was a movement in California, a law passed, and California often leads on some of these things because it has 10% of the U.S. population. But in, I want to say it's about 15 years ago now, uh, California passed a law that you couldn't buy video games under the age of 18. Um, they had to be purchased by adults. And um, it was enforced. All the video games were locked up. But the lobbying of the in industry and parents were like, what are you doing? You can't tell my kid they can't do Grand Theft Auto, my 10-year-old. Um, and parents didn't even know what their kids were doing. They didn't know what the games were. They just knew that their kids were in their rooms playing the games, being quiet. Um, so it had a lot of pushback and California ended up lifting the law and no other state followed. Um, so it takes other states following. France, Germany, and Switzerland put together a consortium in about 2015, really digging into digital literacy. Um, they actually brought me out to meet with them, which was super exciting. And I was a big part of the active consortium. And it's withered because there needs to be um, sustained interest. And we can't pay attention because we're on our phones. This sort of brings me to Barbara's comment. Barbara, would you like to come off mute and talk about what you were mentioning? Which com the the Europe which comment the <laughs> young that young, oh, this, young yeah. children as young as eighteen months old oh, yeah it? yeah yeah I had been in Wegmans uh, a few weeks ago and I see this eighteen month old playing with a, a tablet it was I my heart was just so broken and I did say something to the parent um. I, you, you know, parents need education on how to parent. We're not talking about ethics and morals and religion, but, you know, how to, you know, work with your child. So it, for me, you, you're in a supermarket, for example, talk to that child, say, we're buying eight oranges. Look at the orange, touch the orange. It's round, it's orange. Um and and you do that with what you're getting, especially if they're sitting in the cart, that this is so critical to do this. And I'm talking about this from experience. My son is 33, but when he was little, I would always be explaining and talking with him about things. But I see this now more and more where young children are sitting there playing with the tablet. So it's it's very heartbreaking for me. I feel those children's brains, you know, and I'm sure it's not just in the supermarket, you know. So that's my unfortunate observation. <laughs> no, though, it's but we've had smartphones for 16 years and almost 17, and everyone knows. It's like the students going, "Good to know." I always joke about it. Good to know. <laughs> I do not own a cell phone. I don't own one. And I also notice I live near Cornell 
and when I'm walking, um, not all the Gen Z, but the ears are plugged up. You're missing the birds. You're missing the wind. Go touch a plant, you know, experience, even if you hear nothing. So I say jokingly, but seriously, soon we're going to have new degrees in how to listen, how to make eye contact, and how to have a conversation. It, it's such an obliviousness for me. I mean, I wouldn't even say hello to them. They don't hear anything. <laughs> Media companies are attempting to respond, and they're trying attempting to respond to what seems to be bothering the public the most to try and end the government oversight. So they do respond. There was a re recent TikTok um, that, that went viral, and it was a woman who had um, discovered silent walking. Her boyfriend gave her the challenge of not <laughs> in her AirPods or having her phone out while she walked. And she did <laughs> thing on silent walking that this was the coolest thing ever. And the comments were like, oh my God, Gen Z just thinks they invented walking. But it was, you know, that as digital literacy is taught, and you get a young person who makes that observation and it goes viral and it becomes this challenge, it's like, um, so maybe, maybe part of the solution, the biggest part of the solution is digital literacy <laughs> for everyone, including our, um, in, in the United States, we have a um, very old uh, group of people governing us and they are not, uh, and I don't, I don't know if it's as bad in other countries, but in the United States it is. Um, uh, we have lawmakers in their late 80s who are making decisions about tech. I think that's a great note uh, to wrap up on, that we all need digital literacy irrespective of our ages and backgrounds. And there's a question that is being asked in chat. Um, if there are sources by which we could access your book, of course, we could always buy it, but other sources as well. <laughs> and uh, while we wrap up, of course, thank you so much, Professor Zelevo, Professor Zweisinger. This was a lovely presentation. And uh, our director of the lab, Yonti Fry. One, one more thing to just advertise yes. our incoming media ed forum on January 12th. 13. Yes. It's a two-day conference, global conference, with a lot of different, interesting, different variety of topics, inequality, but also AI, how to teach media literacy in time of wars in different uh, regions um, of uh, the world. So we invite you to come and you have the link to, to come and join. And uh, we have more to come we have the institute that will start at the end of january and more webinar series that uh we're planning so thank you for being part of it thanks for this important yeah i wanted to say thank you to all of you who who uh joined us here i really appreciate it because i know half of us are being pulled toward the door for the holiday so thank you very much it was great to see you randall great to see you're here steve thank you for coming in aaron thank you for joining us also Barbara, Michael, thank you. Yanti, always a pleasure. Davina, always yes. a pleasure. Yes, I'm just going to hit stop recording. <laughs>